Hello everybody, this is Astocky here and welcome to a new how to create a Ticket Server video. Um, this video isn't actually specific to Ticket Servers. Um, it actually covers any kind of Minecraft server that you want to create. Uh, but Ticket really is probably the most popular. Although I'll give you some examples at the end of some other really good servers that you can get as well uh, that will work using this tutorial. Uh, for those of you who don't already have it, um, make sure you turn on annotations. Um, it's the button at the bottom right hand corner of YouTube it's down near where like the uh, HD sort of control quality is uh, it's like a little speech bubble when you turn it on you should see about now a little pop-up that gives you some some things where you can kinda jump through this video to be able to see um, specific parts that you're interested in it's gonna be broken up into um, how to install and make sure you have the right Java how to get the server file and make sure you got it all set up correctly um, how to set up and install the client and how to change the options on that and then some other sort of more generic sort of stuff a little bit about port forwarding and, and firewalls and that kind of stuff um, really importantly I will ban any person who tries to advertise a server on this video that just really annoys me um, if you need help perfectly happy to help anyone just post make sure you post the error that you're getting in the description if you just tell me it says press any key to continue I can't help you you need to tell me what it says and what the error is but um, I guess time to get started okay so here we are at the ticket website but that is not the first thing you're gonna need to do the first thing you're gonna need to do is make sure you have the correct version of Java so the way to check that is to go to I, I use Wikipedia um, I search for Java version history and then you can click on a button when you're at the top that will take you to Java 7 update so basically click on that and it will tell you the latest version of Java so in this case it is Java SE 7 update 21 so you copy that um, however you do your Google searches type in download and then paste that and it will bring up a download window that will let you get what you want so you need to click on that now before we actually go and download anything it's important to make sure you check what version of Java you have so the way you do that is if you're using Windows 7 you go in the bottom left hand corner click the start button click on run and then type CMD in and press enter uh, if you're using Windows 8 clearly you don't have a start button so hold down the Windows key and press R and that will bring up the same run dialog and then you just type CMD and press enter now once the command prompt has come up what you need to do is type Java, J-A-V-A, -A, space, dash, version, V-E-R-S-I-O-N, and press enter. Now you can see in my particular case, it says I have version, so this is Java, ignore the one, Java 7, update number 13. So I have a pretty old version. So 21 is clearly a much newer version, so that means I need to get a newer version. Now, if you get a particular error, um, say say you get this particular thing um, ignore the S because if you just type Java dash version you might get an error that says this is not recognized as an internal or external command operable program or batch file if you get that that means you either don't have Java installed correctly or you've only installed the 32-bit version of Java and you've got a 64-bit operating system but back to getting it because you can see that clearly again I need the new version so what we do is we come over here and we go JRE download it'll take you to the web page you have to accept their licensing agreement and now if you have 64-bit windows you need to download the 64-bit version and the 32-bit version um, I have 64-bit windows 8 so I'm going to be downloading both of them so I'm just going to say right click save as and then save it and then I'm also going to get the windows x86 offline version because it's just a little bit easier than getting the online version so now that I've downloaded both of those, I'm going to close this Technic window in the background because the, the music is really starting to frustrate me. Now, it's important if you have a particular version of Java that's not the latest version to make sure you get rid of it before you install anything. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how you do that. Um, again, if you have Windows 7, you need to go to the bottom left hand corner, go to the start menu and then bring up the control panel. If you've got Windows 8, drag your mouse to the bottom right hand corner and then you'll see like some cogs pop up. Go up and click on the one that says settings and that'll bring up, I'm not sure if you guys can see it or not, it'll bring up like a settings tab on the right hand side and then click control panel. 
It doesn't really matter how you get there, it'll look the same once you get there and then you click uninstall the program. Now in this particular case, we want to go down and I want to get rid of all of my Java 7. If you have Java 6, you have to get rid of that at all. Um, basically, unless you've got the latest version of Java when you do this, you want to get rid of all of them. So in this particular case, I'm going to click on that button there and then right click and say uninstall. Yes, I would like to get rid of that. Getting rid of it, gone. And then we will do the same thing for the 64-bit version. Gone. So now if I bring my command prompt back up by opening it back up again using the run command cmd and now I type in java-version you will see that I get an error message. Now some of you might get that without having uninstalled Java. The getting of the error message is not important. Um, yeah, It doesn't matter how you get it. The important thing is that you know how to fix it. And Okay, here everyone, we are where I've downloaded my two files for Java. Um, you can see that it's given me the i586 version, which is the 32-bit version, and the x64 version. Now, if you have a 32-bit operating system, you won't be able to install the 64-bit version. But even if you have a 64-bit, you make sure you install the i586 version first. Um, so I'm going to double-click on that, and it's going to come up. And we're just going to stick with all the default install options. It's going to do its thing. There we go. Java is now installed. Um, yeah. Something weird popped up then. I'm just going to try installing it one more time. No, I would not like to reinstall. There you go, it's worked. So the next thing we're going to need to do now is install the 64-bit version. So same thing again, double click on it. It pops up. We say we want to install it. It runs. Done. Um, just ignore that window. So now we're going to once, once again bring up command prompt. That was the Windows key and R for those of you who aren't used to it. So now if I type java-version, you can see that I now have version 21. So that is the end of how to install Java. That means Java is working correctly. If you again get that error saying um, that command is not recognized, you've either messed something up with your install or you might have only installed one of the versions and you need to install both of them. So uh, next, I'm going to go on to how to get the server files and how to install the server. So, back in a moment. Okay, so here we are with the part of how to create a ticket server of actually getting yourself the server file and installing the server file. So, basically what you're going to need to do is you're going to want to come into here into mod packs and you can either pick Tekkit, which is the very latest version of Tekkit for Minecraft 1.5.1. You can pick Tekkit Lite, which is... Uh, version for 1.4 I think the latest version was 1.4.6 but it's basically the 1.4 version of Tekkit and it includes a whole lot of um, updates from the original Tekkit classic um, but it's only for 1.4 so really if you want the latest you want Tekkit um, Tekkit classic though is the original bucket version which allows you to use bucket plugins it's for Minecraft 1.2.5 though, so it's a bit older version. Now you've also got Big Dig, Vaults and Hack Mine. Now this tutorial should work just fine for any of those, but I'm going to use uh, Tekkit because it's the latest and it's the coolest, and I wish there was some way that I could turn off that music. So here you have a really you know, fantastic, cool website. Um, yeah, I'm not going to worry about any of that kind of stuff. All you need to do is you need to download the server file. So download the launcher will give you the actual launcher not the server file. You want the server file. So you have to come a fair way down we get down near the bottom and there is the button just there. Download Tekkit 1.0.5 server. So we click on that button and I've already created a folder called Tekkit that I'm going to put it in. So we click on save and once it's finished doing its little virus check and making sure everything's saved correctly. There we go. We can right click and say show in folder and there it is. So I've also downloaded the launcher but I'm going to delete that now because I just wanted to make sure that I was downloading to the right place. So basically if you try and double click on it it'll open up. If you try to run it from here it won't work. It's just going to fall over and stop working. So what you want to do is you want to um, it's easy if you've got 7-zip like I do. 
you want to basically create a new folder though and call it server. So wherever you put it doesn't really matter, but you want to create a new folder and then you want to take all of the files and put them into that folder. So now that we know we have Java working, we need to open up the server and here we have our launch.bat. Now if you can't see the .bat extension, that means you've got file extensions hidden. And so if you're using Windows 7, uh, you have like a tool options menu. Um, Windows 8 has a whole lot of different menus. So you can see you've got all these different menus. But yeah, under Windows 8, you want to click on the View tab, and then you want to click under Options, and it'll basically open up folder options, which is the same as you can get with Alt T O. Um, at least I think Windows 8 still supports that. Oops, that was the wrong button. Um, hopefully that didn't screw up the video too much. But yeah, you got Alt T. Okay, so no, Alt T O doesn't work in Windows 8, but it does work in Windows 7. Or you can go to the to the tools menu and then go to options but either way you want to end up just here and then you want to go to view and you want to scroll down and untick this box here that says hide extensions for known file types that's important because it'll let you see the extensions of all the files you have so then you want to right click on launch.bat and say edit and there we have the batch file so hopefully you guys can read that now if you have the 64-bit version and you can tell that by when you bring up the command prompt and type Java like we did a few moments ago dash version you can see just here it says 64-bit server uh, if it says 64-bit server that means you have 64-bit if it doesn't say 64-bit server that means you have 32-bit now if you have 32-bit you'll need to change this value just here to 1 and this value just here to 1 otherwise it won't work so we're going to leave them as 3 and 2 now the the other reason you might need to change those values is if you have less than about 4 gigabytes of RAM on your computer that you're running the server on, uh, you probably won't get it to work correctly using 3 and 2, you'll have to use 1 and 1. But in this case, it's going to work just fine for me. So I'm going to go exit, and now basically what you do is you just double click on that launch.bat file, and it will run the server. But before we run the server, we're actually going to right click here on server.properties, and normally your system won't recognize a dot properties extension so you'll have to say open and then it'll bring up basically it'll bring up the choose default program now this looks totally different depending on what operating system you have but basically you need to pick the option of what you're going to open it in and uh, you can either pick to use notepad or in this case I use notepad plus plus kind of whatever you use um, really should work just fine but basically you want to be able to open it up so you can have a look in here and edit it. Now, <clears throat> here are all the files, well, all the configuration file parts that you're going to need. So I'll just do a quick explanation of what they do. Basically, world sets the folder name that it's going to use to store your world files. So I'm going to call this techit, and you'll see in a second that it'll create files called techit. The server port is what people need to put at the end of the IP when they type the IP in to connect to the server. So by default it's 25565. Uh, the only reason you would ever need to change that is if um, you have a, a server provider or you have someone else or you have a problem with your firewall, just anything that might block that port because uh, some things that see that port as being a security risk and block it. Um, it doesn't for me so I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to change the level type but you can change it from default to flat or any other options that Minecraft has. Level seed if you have a particular seed that you know works really well, uh, you can change that, but otherwise I just wouldn't bother. Uh, server IP. The only time you will ever put anything in this line here is if you're using Hamachi. Now I'll explain that a bit later, but that's where you would put the Hamachi IP in. Otherwise, it will default to whatever the IP of the computer it's running on, and that will work just perfect. Uh, max build height. 256 is the default. You can set it lower if you don't want people building too high. Um, I don't think it really makes a huge difference, but I think sometimes you can get a bit of lag if you have a slower server and you get let people build too high. Um, spawn NPCs, true false, pretty easy. Whitelist, true false. If you set that to true, only people who are on the whitelist, that's their Minecraft username or their Minecraft login email, will be able to actually connect to the server. Um, that can be important if you're running a non-bucket server like the new tech it is 
and you don't want people to be able to get in and grief because it's it's kind of difficult to have grief pre prevention on the on the new versions of servers. Spawn animals, true false, pretty pretty standard. Hardcore. Now, basically, I think the way hardcore works on a server is when you die, it kicks you off the server and you're out. Um, I'm not sure if you can get back in. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that mode. That's not something I've ever messed with. I like to leave it false because I die a lot. Um, now, texture pack. I believe that allows you to set a default texture pack that people will have to use to be able to connect to the server. Um, not totally sure how that line works either. I've never really played with it because I, I like to stick with the vanilla texture pack. Online mode. This is basically the configuration that lets the server connect to the Mojang servers and verify the people who are trying to connect. Um, it's important to have that because if you have online mode set to false, um, you can end up getting people's login as like player and then the next time they log in it might log them in with something a bit different and that can make people lose their inventories and kind of stuff people up. Basically it's important to make sure you authenticate who people are. The next one, PvP, um, you can set that to true or false. I like to go for the kind of co-op building server so I like to have that set to false. Uh, you've got your difficulty uh, which is one for easy, two for normal, three for hard. Um, I think it defaults to easy so you can just kind of leave that. Game mode is zero which is survival or you can make it one if you want creative. Um, that's just like a default server setting. You can individually turn people on and off if you're an op on the server. And I'll explain how opping people works a bit later on in this tutorial. The next thing is max players. Now, pretty much the way this works is you divide the number of players you have by 10, and that's how many gig of RAM you need to really have. So if you uh, have set it to 1 gig of RAM, then don't go above 10 players otherwise you'll end up with things crashing and things not working very well. Um, in this case I've set it to 20. Um, that's going to work really fine because I've set the default settings which is 3 gig of RAM. Um, the other thing that's important to limit is your internet bandwidth. Now you basically need between 256 kilobytes to 512 kilobytes of internet bandwidth per person who's going to be playing plus th obviously the servers connecting on your internet as well. So Let's say you have a one megabit internet connection. That means you could have up to three people plus the server connecting at the same time. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So you know, 256 times the number of people, which would be you know three times 256 would be 700 plus then one for the server to make it four times, which would be a gig. So I have a three meg connection. So I couldn't set this to be any higher than 11. I think that's right. Yeah, so you add one, make it 12. Yep, so that's pretty much how it would work. So I could set this to 11, and that would be pretty much using up all my internet bandwidth. Now the next one is spawn monsters. Um, leave that true, it could be pretty boring. Generate structures, same kind of thing. Now view distance is how much the server buffers and sends to people. Now if you have a slow internet connection, you might need to drop that number a little bit. Um, I think a view distance of about 8 corresponds with far. So the visual setting that the player sets has no bearing on this unless you drop this number right down and then they set it a bit higher. So if they set themselves to far and you change the view distance to like two or three, um, it would limit them to like a short distance. Yeah, I, I would never change that number unless you're finding people are having a lot of lag when they're loading new chunks and things, and then maybe you could look to change it. But we'll now click save. And we're basically ready to go. So now we double click on launch.bat and bring it over and you can see it's doing a bunch of stuff here just gotta ignore it for a little while because it's doing its thing it takes quite a long time to get it to work because the very first time it has to load all the mods it has to make sure their configuration files are set up correctly it takes a little while you just wait and eventually what will happen is it will just stop So there you go, it's now preparing spawn. This is about the last thing that it does before it stops. So basically what it's doing is it's just setting up all the dimensions correctly. And we just wait. And you can see there that now it's kind of got to the point where it's not doing anything. That basically means it's finished. So once it's finished, the only way to stop the server correctly without causing problems is to type STOP and press enter. 
Now that thing I'm always going to refer to as the server console. So if I say do something in the server console, that's the place where you do it. So you can see it now it's now come up with pause, press any key to continue. If you see pause, press any key to continue, or just press any key to continue before you get to the point like here where it just stops. Um, yeah, it was like here where I type stop. If before you get to this point, so you had all those things happen, um, you get a press any key to continue. That means the server has an error and you need to tell me what it just says just before it. Um, particularly things that say like STD error, those kinds of things. Now if I close this and run launch.bat again, you can see the second time it runs, it should run a lot quicker because this time it's already done the config files and all it's doing is basically just reloading everything. So once again we just wait. Equivalent Exchange 3 is loading, Thermal Expansion is loading. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Just got to wait a few seconds. And there we go. So now it's once again stopped. That means we're good to go. So yeah, if, if before you get to this point, or you see the Minecraft dash server done line, you get the press enter key to continue. That means an error. And that's what you need to tell me. And then post it in the comments, and I'm perfectly happy to help. So for now, anyway, we're going to type stop because the next thing we need to do, and this is going on to the next part of the video, uh, is we need to get the client configured so that we can actually test the server and make sure it works. Um, so I'm going to pause the video and I'll be back in a few seconds. Okay, so here we are back at the Technic Pack Tech It website. And what we want to do this time to get the client to work, we basically want to click download the launcher. And it will take you to this page here where you can download the launcher. Now most of you are going to jump straight to this button here that says Windows. But we don't want to do that. What we want to do in this particular case is get techniclauncher.jar. And there's a bit of a reason for that. And I will show you what that is in a second. But basically you want to download that. And I save it in the same place where I saved the zip file before. So we save the file. Everything works OK. Now we're going to go show in folder. Now, for some people, it doesn't happen to everyone, you want to right click on that and hit properties. And you can see here in my particular case, it says this file came from another computer and might be blocked. Click unblock and click apply. Basically, that blocking can sometimes make your firewall treat it like it's a bad thing and that will stop it from happening. Now, I don't think that's going to happen with the server files because they came out of a zip. Um, but again, it's, it's worth checking just to make sure that's not going to happen and it, and it hasn't happened with the server, but it does happen with the client. Now, you could double click on that, but a little thing that I do is I go uh, right click and say new and then say, uh, it should be text document, but it's called Notepad++ for me. And I create a file called launch launchtechit.bat and then I delete the TXT off the end. It's important to make sure you're showing file extensions when you do this, otherwise you'll just get a text file at the end. So yes, are you sure you want to change it? Yes, and you can see now that the symbol on the left hand side changes from a notepad file uh, to a different kind of file. So now we right click and say edit, and basically here we type the command java space dash and then we want to type this in exactly as it's written just there. T E C H N I C L A U N C H E R dot jar. And whoops, I actually missed. You're supposed to type dash jar technic launcher dot jar. So what should now happen if we hit file, save, file, exit? When we double click on that, it will run. But that will run it exactly the same as if you double clicked. Uh, just here on techniclauncher.jar and that's not what we want because what we want to do is we want the Technic Launcher to save all of its files in this folder just here which is um, just like it would do if you were um, kind of setting and setting up a game or installing a game yourself and that's important because otherwise it'll stick it in your app data folder and <clears throat> That's sometimes okay, but sometimes it can make it a bit of a pain to find save files and things like that. So I like to keep everything really convenient and all in the one spot. And I'm going to do that by editing this launch.bat. So I'll be with you in a second. Sorry about that break, I just had a cough then. Um, so what we do now is we go back to editing the launch.bat. 
and what we want to type in is what I've just put here so the the at symbol is not important but you basically want to type set set space app data all in capitals a p p d a t a equals percent c d percent now basically what that will mean is it will set up a temporary variable called app data in the current directory that it's in and that'll make the technic launcher think that it wants to run it from this folder so we'll hit file save file exit uh, really simple little batch script and we double click on it and you can see there that it's running uh, you can just move that out of the way this is the important bit it says no installation of technic found technic launcher will install that and it will install in the directory you've told it to it gives you the option to change it but because we've used the batch file we don't need to do that so we can say no we'll just install it uh, exactly where we've put it so you can see here that it does its thing and it installs itself now at this point you can see on the left you have and it's just kind of a revolving screen all the different clients that you can get so you can add a new pack play vanilla minecraft play hack mine play the yog box take it classic the big dig vaults take it light or take it you know you got all of those different options but before we do any of them the first thing you're going to need to do is type in your username which in my case is a stocky and you'll need to type in your password and say remember and now in this particular case I want to launch tech it now if we click on the little cog wheel up here that will open up the launcher options now you don't really need to change the, launch, the launcher options unless you have problems with memory now you should never have problems with memory when you have it set to one gig but in some cases and actually that's a very important note they've just set there more memory is not always better more memory makes your CPU work harder so only change that one gig if you have a real issue where you might want to change it to say maybe two gig definitely don't change it if you only have a 64-bit operating system but basically I'm not going to change that at all because like I said you just don't need to in, in my uh, I guess experience the important button you will need it used to be an options button down here now it's this little cog wheel over here you click on that and that brings up the actual options for tech it which is the one that I had open now if I was to say go to tech it light and click it it brings up the options for tech it light now basically what you want to do is make sure this is ticked on always use recommended builds there's no need to change that the only time I would change it is if you have a particular server that might be running an older version and normally the person you're trying to connect to will tell you they might say hey I've got a 1.0.4 version in that case what you want to do is click manually select and then come up here and you can pick an earlier version so you can see here they're currently working on 1.0.6 but the server that we downloaded if we go back to the server folder you can see here the zip is 1.0.5 so that's the one that we want to go for so we're going to stick with always use recommended because that's giving me the right version and I'm not going to click save because I didn't make any changes now at this point you basically click on take it to make sure it's selected and then click launch and it will now connect you it'll log in it will download all of the files that you need and then it will basically install them for you and it'll get everything ready so I'm going to pause the video now and I'm going to come back once it's finished okay so that takes quite a while to load um, there's no real way to get around that the first time it runs it just takes some time so now um, you can go into options and you know you've got all your different options uh, I'm going to turn the the sound right down and turn the music off invert the mouse because that's how I like it now to make sure your clients working correctly you want to test it so you want to create yourself a new world you don't really need to mess with anything basically just create a basic world just to make sure that it is working correctly now this is also what you would want to do if you're going to play tech it single player so it should be a couple more seconds here we go so we have just created ourselves a world now it's going to be a bit laggy for me uh, and probably for you guys watching it because of the way I'm doing the recording I'm doing a screen capture uh, rather than actually capturing the Minecraft window itself but you can see it's working we can open it up you can see any eyes working there are lots of different mods and things installed so you know that it's working correctly so now that we know that the client is working we're going to leave the client running and we're going to go back to the folder we were in a few moments ago 
where the server is located and we are going to open up the server and then run launch.bat so you can see here we're now running the server at the same time as running the client and now this is because um, we are going to test to make sure that our server has been correctly installed and is working correctly really easy to do you're crazy if you don't do it and the reason I'd say you're crazy if you don't do it is if other people are connecting and potentially having issues or you're trying on a different computer and connecting and having issues you don't know whether the issues are caused by the fact that uh, the server's not working or the, just the connection's not working so here we have um, the thing that says where was it? there we go Minecraft server done it's just unloaded the couple of dimensions that it hasn't needed and the server is now running so now we want to go multiplier now this is just for testing we're going to do direct connect and we're going to type local host this will only work um, well it will work for testing purposes it will also work if you're playing the client on the same computer that you're playing the server on so if you only have one PC at home and you want to connect to it this is how you do it other people who are on the same network as you or on the internet will not be able to connect using this this is just for you so it's localhost and then the colon and then 25565 which was like the default port that I had before if you've changed the port to something else uh, you'll need to make sure that you change that number to match up so then you click join server and you can see up in the top left here there was a whole lot of stuff that happened and it said loading player a stocky sending check to a stocky and now I'm in the server so now I'm not playing on the client I'm playing on the server now if you uh, had a whitelist turned on to true uh, you'd get a message saying that this player is not whitelisted now the next thing is um, normally what will happen I'm not sure where it was that I spawned normally what will happen is anyway when you're too close to spawn you'll have an issue where you can't break blocks because of spawn protection um, I ran away from spawn too quickly so I've left the spawn protection area but basically that's what you have to do you have to leave uh, where you spawn because that area is protected the other way you can fix that and this is also important if you want to kind of run the server for any length of time is you come back to your command here and you type in op space and then the username that you want to op so it says there opt a stocky now what I have to do it says there that I've been opt but it won't actually work so if I come over here and I try to spawn a block in at the moment ah there you go it did work because I'm opt okay cool so if I if I de-opt myself that's obviously something that they've changed so that if I right click now and try and spawn items in it doesn't work it automatically puts you in recipe mode um, you used to have to log off the server and log back in to get it to update but they clearly have fixed that in the new version which is which is a really good thing because it used to be a pain but basically I now know that my uh, server is working correctly my clients working correctly the two of them can com communicate and clearly to get to this point I had to make sure my Java's working so I'm going to pause the video now and I'm going to come back and talk just a couple about a couple more things that might be interesting. So, uh, back soon. Okay guys, so uh, here I am for the last part of the video. This is just going to be a quick kind of wrap up on things and a little bit of talk about uh, how to kind of get things working. Now, if you want people who are on a local network with you to connect, what you will need to do is once again bring up command prompt. It is just such a useful tool. Now, if you type IP c-o-n-f-i-g and press enter you can see just here under wireless LAN because that's the way that I'm connecting um, it gives you an IP address Now that particular IP address just there is your local IP address and that will be the the address that the server will default to and that is really important because you might need it for a couple of things uh, if people are connecting via a local network they'll need to put that IP number in colon and then whatever the port you give them is so that's for people who are connecting locally uh, you will need that number though if you intend to port forward your server because you'll need to set your IP up but before we get to the details of port forwarding um, it's time to talk firewalls now it doesn't happen for everyone but some people will get an issue where either the server can't authenticate people or people just can't connect to the server at all 
So the most common cause for that is firewalls. Now I can't really show you how to fix your firewall up and the, and the reason I can't really show you how to fix your firewall up is because every firewall is different but pretty much all of them have an option called exceptions and what you want to do is you want to add an exception for Java. So just java.exe needs to have an exception and you need to make sure you point to the correct Java and the way you make sure you point to the correct Java is you want to point to the Java if you have a program files and a program files x86 that means you've got 64-bit windows so you want to go to the one that's in program files and then Java and then JRE7 and then bin and that is the java.exe that you want to have the exception for um, if you do it for the 32-bit version but then launch the server with the 64-bit version it's not going to help you so that would be a bit of a waste of time now now that you've got your IP address and you know that your firewall is not going to be blocking anything if you intend to port forward you come to Google and type what's my IP and that will tell you your public IP address that's the internet address of your computer or at least your house because normally if you have multiple computers connected to the same wireless or the same internet they'll all have the same IP <clears throat> that number depending on how your internet is configured can change a lot um, for some people it changes every single day for some people it only changes when the router resets itself or your internet cable modem or however you've got it configured resets itself um, so yeah what I would do is I would each time you intend to run the server and launch it uh, check what your public IP address is and make sure anyone need, that needs to connect to it knows what it is um, some internet service providers will let you pay more money to make sure you have one that's the same all the time um, I'm gonna ignore this thing down here trust the one that Google gives you that's that's a pretty safe bet the reason that number there is important is because unlike before where I showed you like the 192.168 number that is only gonna work on your local network this one and then the colon and then the 25565 or whatever your port is is what people will need to use to connect from the internet but putting that number in won't actually do any good unless they've port forwarded so I'm hoping this will work so um, some of them like portforward.com some of them are really really dodgy and I wouldn't trust them um, WikiHow is normally fairly safe um, although the particular example they're giving you here only really works for Linux but basically what you'll need to do is you'll need to bring up a window like this which is like your modem login screen now exactly how that works depends on the particular brand of modem you have um, some of them you have like uh, you have like 192.168.1.1 uh, or dot zero dot one it, it, it depends on the particular modem that you have what the login is going to be uh, mine might even be dot zero dot one there we go so you can see that I have one nine two dot one six eight dot zero dot one and you'll almost always have a login screen so here we go login and once you've logged in it will give you a whole lot of information now what you're seeing here is specific if you have a Netgear wireless router um, it will depend completely on the kind of thing you have um, now some of them will have a button called port forwarding some of them won't now if I click on that particular port forwarding button you can see that I have forwarded uh, 25566 to the IP address ending in 16 and you saw that 16 is mine I also have 25565 forwarded to 20 which is what I actually run my server on so you can see because of that if I run the server that I set up earlier um, whoops wrong folder yes so if I run this particular server that I set up earlier and I show you the server.properties you can see I have it set to 25565 so if people try to connect to that it's not going to connect to my computer which is not what you want you basically want to set up call it whatever you want doesn't matter what you call it but you need to say you want the start and end ports to be forwarded to the same internal ports all the protocols whatever the options are and you want to hear type in the IP address of the computer that you're on that's very important now the next thing 
Now, each modem calls it something different. Some won't call it port forwarding. Um, yeah, some will just call it really weird things. Um, it's kind of a little bit hit and miss. The best way to find out is to check your manual. But then the next thing that you want to do is you want to go to, mine calls it LAN IP, uh, but there are other options. You really need to kind of experiment around and check what it is with yours. But basically, it you will type in an IP address. Don't worry about the subnet mark. The important thing though is when we get down here, you can see that we have these lease time, which is 3600. Now what that means is every 3600, it can potentially kick the computer off and give it a new IP. That's good because it allows lots of different devices to connect. Uh, it's bad though because what it can mean is the very next time I restart this computer, it could give me a different IP than 16, which means my port forwarding won't work. So what you have to do is you have to come into here and you can see that when I type this particular information in, you can see that here I had a local IP address, which was that IP address there, but what you should also have is a MAC address. Now, there's a complicated command you can type in to get it. Sometimes it comes up by default. In this case, it hasn't. But what's important um, is there is almost always a way to do it. I'm not sure exactly what the option is in my particular case it just shows it up down the bottom here so these are the current IPs that are connected 10 12 and 16 so looking here I know mine is 16 so I need this number at the beginning and the reason I need that number is if I type that number in here where it says MAC address so you type it in two letters at a time and then type in my current IP address and click add it will add me to the reserve list now some people call it adding a static IP like I said, each modem, router, whatever, gives it a different name for how to do it. Um, but basically what you want to do is reserve that IP so it will always give, in my case, this computer, the IP that ends in 16. That's basically the way to ensure your port forwarding is working. So now that I've done that, pretty much everything is set up that if someone wanted to connect to me, they could use my internet IP address and the correct port, which would be the 25566 and it would connect straight to the server and as long as they had the right client it would authenticate them and everything would work. Now if you have a particular issue um, sometimes you'll get messages that talk about um, some, something will come up in the server window saying that there was a problem with the client uh, it could be that they have the wrong version the Minecraft is actually getting much better now that it gives you a lot more detail on what the error is whatever the error you get is if you can Make sure, for starters, that you've correctly set up your port forwarding. Post whatever the error they get as the client is. And if you get any particular error messages that pop up in the server console, uh, put those as well, and I'll try and see if I can do my best to help you. Otherwise, that is pretty much everything you're going to need to create a ticket server and then to port forward that server. Now, there's one more thing that I would like to tell all of you guys, and that is um, to check out the ASTOCKY team launcher. Basically, the Ace Docky Team Launcher uh, allows you to launch any of these packs. There's the Ace Docky Pack, which is my pack for Minecraft 1.4.7. Uh, there's Hero Craft Reloaded. There's the Almighty Pack and the Solitary Craft. Now, Solitary Craft is a really cool mod pack. Um, it's for Minecraft 1.5.1, and it includes pretty much every mod you can possibly get. And the way it does that is it does it by prompting you to download all the files. That way there's no legal problems with it working because you're downloading all the files from the links that the mod developers give you. They're getting the AdFly links, they're getting the revenue. We're supporting the developers in the way that you support the developers if you manually download them because manually downloading them is what you're doing. But what it does is it then automatically configures them and automatically installs them for you to take all the hassle out of changing block IDs and getting everything to work. The most important part of it though is that it lets you select the particular mods that you want to have installed. Basically it gives you your own customizable mod pack using uh, pretty much all of the mods. The other thing I love about this is Hey Yorkie, who's the current guy who maintains the Solitary Craft pack, um, he basically makes sure 
I guess for those of you who've been looking at mod packs like Feed the Beast and things like that, you'll know that 1.5.1 has been out for a couple of months now and they're almost up to 1.6. It still hasn't updated from 1.4.7. What that means is you're not getting the best Minecraft experience that the mod developers really wanted you to have. Um, you can see Tech it has updated to 1.5.1. Uh, but it, it, it again took quite a while, there was a lot of playtesting, a lot of different things that they were doing. Basically this mod pack, as soon as a mod updates, the new version will come out and you can decide if you want to install that new version and update to the new version. And if you do and you have any problems, um, at the Astocky Team forums just here is where you get all the help you can possibly need. Support with Minecraft, support with the mods, um, help with doing everything. But yeah, this is basically, you know, mutant creatures, mob amputation, any mod you can think of is pretty much in here. Um, really good changelog. It's really good. It's just finished its beta. So it's now, you know, it's ready, it's stable. Um, it is fantastic. Uh, the guy who actually maintains this is the guy who does some the, all the really fantastic Thorncraft 3 tutorials. Um, so if you check out the Thorncraft 3 at Minecraft forums, uh, you'll see basically the link to, to his videos on this. Um, yeah, he maintains this, he does his own let's plays on it, but the important thing is he keeps it up to date. Um, you can see here, he updated it 11 hours ago, he updated it the day before, he updated it the day before that. Basically, it gets updated almost every day, so you, you know you're always getting the very latest, the very greatest bug fixes, exactly the way that the developers really want you to be playing Minecraft. So, hope you guys have enjoyed this tutorial, I hope you guys check out the A-Stocky launcher and check out the Solitary Craft Pack. Um, thanks for watching. A stocky out.